The cost of every claim is through the roof because the car's just more expensive to maintain. Hello, my name is Jason Reichel, and you're listening to Risk Management Brick by Brick. I'm fascinated with people who are helping build and maintain the physical world around us. On each episode of this podcast, we'll dive in with a risk manager, speak to them about how technology plays a role in this process. Welcome back to Brick by Brick. Uh, we're at ITC, and we're with Elron, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Raven.ai. We were talking a little bit before this camera started rolling, but let's give a little background on you, your history, what Raven does, and then we'll get into the questions. First of all, thanks for having me. Of course, man. Very exciting to be here. So Raven was actually born out of um, a Shell energy technology lab that I was running uh, back in the UK about almost 10 years ago. Okay. And the whole concept was just like scanning cars, taking pictures of them, so we can tell drivers if they need a tire replacement, or they had rust or something, yeah. and kind of upsell that as part of the Shell products. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, we realized there was no business there. Oh, <laughs> first but pivot. The first lucky coincidence we had, and I'm going to go back to coincidence because it plays a big role in startups and in ours yeah. uh, in particular, is that Avis and, and Hertz and those guys, the rental car companies, noticed us. And they said, why well, don't you come over and install the system in our locations and start tracking damage. So uh, what we did is spun out, spinning out the company to an independent venture. Uh, we raised venture funding and started working with the car rental and fleet uh, industry. So fleet management, you know, you really care about the quality of the car. Exactly. And grabbing images of damages and we gained a lot of data in the process. And over the years, we've evolved that into other use cases. And the reason why I'm sitting here with you at ITC is that through the second coincidence, we've built a holistic scan of a vehicle. Uh, it's a tool that sits in your web browser, so you can use any phone. You don't need to download any app. And insurance companies use that with their policyholders where you report damage. And instead of sending you a personal like visit of an adjuster or sending you to a body shop, you can do it self-service. You can scan the car, find the damage, and we would recommend if the vehicle needs to be salvaged, total loss, or it can be repaired. So you're doing the first line uh, assessment, essentially, of the vehicles. Sure. So much data that the insurer needs to make the assessment and cut down the, the whole kind of cycle time of the claim. Right. I'm saying it's a coincidence uh, because uh, it came from the fact that we came from the, the fleet industry. We built that holistic scan. Right. And um, that gave us a lot more rigor and accuracy. Yeah, right. So because you were working with enterprise companies like the Avises, like those kind of companies in the world, you've actually built a re more redundant system, which is the problem with AI right now. Like AI is coming up and they don't really have a, they're there yet. They have a maybe an interesting processing, maybe interesting idea, but they don't have the data and all the stuff that really feeds it. No one ever really talks about how in order to have a successful AI startup in insurance, you need, a, you need your own data source for it to create your own LLM. Absolutely. How did you guys solve that problem? I mean, with this, all this data, but then when did, it, when did it connect that we have all this data and we can actually connect it up? How did that happen? You know what? I was sitting here at ITC a um, couple of years ago and everybody was talking about how AI hasn't delivered. There was a big promise. If you go back five, six years ago, everybody was talking about how AI would go into each and every part of the industry, right. but it never went into auto assessment in a big way. And part of that reason is that the data was not right. Um, even people who are who, companies who were doing damage assessments didn't have the correct data sets to train a model. And the models were not great. Right. Today, the models are great and you've got better data. And we are, again, a lucky coincidence that we've been working with car rental companies. So we've seen cars driving in mint condition yeah. and then starting to accumulate damage. So we had the training data and we now also have better models thanks to the whole evolution of AI. Right. So you got, let's say, a degrading of the asset over time because every single time it will run through your scanners, Correct. right? That's, and, and, that's the advantage. That's the advantage and, and better images of that asset because we have a 360. 
Right. It's not that somebody just grabbed a photo of a broken bumper. We have a full 360 of the car, including the zoom ins on the damage from right. multiple angles. If I'm a human adjuster, let's go back to why is this better than a human adjuster or why is it aid the human adjuster? It's because if I'm a human adjuster, I'm looking for damage and only if I can notice damage, I'm taking the photo Spot of the on. damage, right? Spot on. So you need something that's like a checkup, like just like health or anything else. It's like a weight scale is not indication of anything. It's just over time you can see changes. Exactly. And so the system has developed so much that we are able to tell you as an individual who has no experience in taking photos, we tell you, hey, look, there's damage there. Please, can you, on the spot, can you come closer and show us? Yeah. That gives you a full set of images for both AI and human adjusters. Yeah. Great. Where do you see the balance between automation and human judgment over the next five years? Like, if we're doing this five years from now, what's the role of the human? What's the role of the AI? As everywhere, there's an 80-20 rule. I think 80% of the claims will have 80% uh, automation, something like that. Yeah. Um, and the rest is going to be flagged for humans to review. There will always be some of them in person, but I'd say 80% mostly automated and 20% mostly in person. Yeah, what people don't understand, and I think this is a really, especially about your use case and use cases about AI like this is, the alternative wasn't, you're not replacing humans. The alternative was it just didn't get done. Everyone knew, and in risk management, every risk manager knows you should do a risk matrix. For every vendor relationship you have, they know that you should deploy a real, how solid is this business? Can they match with our growth? They only do that for a very few of the businesses, right? right? Because it's time consuming all this. So you can bring AI into those scenarios where you know what the best practice is, but humans can't always do what's best with the time constraints that we have on our hands. Absolutely. And this problem becomes graver as, more, as the cost of each claim rises. So you see now maybe frequency of claims is decreasing slightly because of EDAS and all that, those systems. But the cost of every claim is through the roof because the car's just more expensive to maintain and the people are more expensive. What about, where do you see this fitting in? Where's your vision with autonomous vehicles and this? Is this even more important in a world of autonomous vehicles where no one's driving them and no one's noticing, oh, this clunking sound that I hear suddenly? Like, are you focused on that at all? Is that in an industry you're interested in? Absolutely. Look, first of all, the, the good thing about them, they've got lots of cameras. Yeah. So you can get- Very expensive to fix though. Very expensive fix, but they've got good quality uh, cameras. So it means that our input can come from various sources. So to the extent that they're kind of inspecting themselves, if you like. Yeah, right. Um, but then also expensive to, to maintain and, and expensive to repair. So every crash will be, will claim, merit more investigation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think the need for these technologies will just rise. Uh, speed and accuracy are often touted as the advances of an AI driven claims. But how do we ensure customers trust AI's decisions? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think it's all about transparency, giving the grounds for your decision and giving evidence. So in our case, more images, look, this is your vehicle. This is what we need to repair it for. Um, these are the defected parts. Just give a, a lot more detail behind it so you can justify your position. I also think because you guys are not trying to be the people who repair the car, you have no skin in the game if what they do with the information on their own. They could just continue to... This is advice, yeah. yeah. We're just collecting pieces of information that are currently very difficult to, to collect today for a claim adjuster. Yeah. They would sit there, they would look for the report from the police, report from the body shop, report from the customer. Um, we just bring everything as early as possible in a very structured way. Why are you tackling this from the insurance perspective? Claims, I understand that. But why not from the man car manufacturing perspective of how do people actually really drive these cars? How do people really hurt? How do you make more resilient cars in the face of that? Is is that conversations that are occurring? Are are are, are manufacturers interested in this? Or once it's off their law, are they still like, well, then that's off my I don't care about it at that point? Again, that's you're very visionary with this uh with this view. I think it's definitely a a longer term prospect for car manufacturers because the level of data that we're collecting, it can be very helpful for them also to understand how their vehicles are, are performing on the roads. Performing on the road, exactly. Like, okay, is like is this F-150 bumper getting hit all the time? Well, I can imagine for your brand right now, if something goes wrong with all the, every time I see a Tesla broken down on the side of the road, I'm like, not buying a Tesla, you know, like, so there's this mental image as well. That, that starts flowing back to the uh, manufacturers, but I'd say in terms of uh, being a, relatively small business like ours, we want to go to the immediate friction, which is with the insurance company. Yeah.
this must play a role too, because in claims adjusting after 2020 and a lot of people left the industry, there's not also these expert, the expertise required to do this work successfully. For carrier brokers and repair networks, what does successful adoption of AI in claims look like? I hate this question, but really what I wanted to get to is how fast can they see immediate improvement in their business process from putting the, this kind of stuff in? And what's required from them from an investment standpoint? Customers we work with will realize roughly 50% average cycle time reduction. So I'll give you an example of an Australian customer we work with. They are reported on average about 14 days start to finish. And we shrunk it down to less than seven. So that's a, a reference point. And that carries so a lot of- you improve the velocity of return? The velocity, yeah. yeah. So that translates to savings like higher car that you have to provide the customer, tow uh, uh, cost, storage, even litigation, yeah. and ultimately just customer experience and which translates to retention. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big deal. That's in the thousands of dollars per, per claim. In terms of how costly it is, we've had customers that just like plug into the system without any integration. So our system is built on a web browser. All right. So I can just send you a bunch of links and you can send them off to your customers. As soon as they file a claim, you send it off to them. Of course, there are more automated ways to do it. We can send it via API. Yeah. You request a link and, and we send it to you. And then um, integrating the report back into your um, management. play management system. What so play management systems do like you? Like Guidewire. And Guidewire, those okay. Yeah. We, we allow that. Okay, cool. And let me ask you one year from now, where's Raven AI going to be? What What's the next year look like? So we're seeing a lot of traction in the commercial side, actually. Yeah. So a lot of people think immediately about passenger cars because that's the mass market. Yeah. But actually, there's a lot of other assets out there. Uh, like a municipality cars, things like that. Trucks, forklifts, things like that. They, these are very expensive assets that get damaged all the time because they're being used commercially. Are you talking to like equipment leasing companies in order to put equipment, this in for um, insurers, fleets, yeah. people like that, even dealers and auctions uh, that need that sort of assessment? The platform has gotten so sophisticated that we're now able to cater to that use case. What about um, this? Is just a curiosity question, but like municipalities who have all their own fleets and, and things like that, because I can't imagine that they're doing that good of a job at understanding the damage being done to these assets over time. Is there, a, does this feed into accounting information and things like that for uh, asset depreciation? Like where does this all, how does this, I understand the whole part of being able to see the health of a car over time, see what's wrong with it. Is there real advantage than plugging this into all the other elements of, of your business? And uh, do you have customers already yeah, successfully doing that. We have customers that started doing that. I would say the the frontier is even bigger than that. So think about like a uh, health records. Like when you go and get insurance today, or you're trying to sell an asset, you want to look up their history. Carfax is an Carfax, example. Carfax, right? So Carfax will document major repairs being done if they were reported. Yeah, right. Uh, if you have a record of scans over the time of the uh, the lifetime of the asset you get a more detailed view of what happened to this asset over time. Yeah. So I think that's that's where we're aiming for. Yeah, that transparency of asset quality is very interesting, exactly. right? Exactly. How was it treated? Yeah, absolutely. Closing question for you. We're both in the insure tech space, right? I think it's really exciting. I talked to a lot of people to try to convince them that this is a good place to go because we're actually impacting the, the built world, right, with insurance. What's your piece of advice or in what, what part of the industry do you think people should look at that's interesting? That's a great question. Uh, I'd say the overall advice is just get real world experience. Step out of academia as quickly as you can. And that's funny coming from your background, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I did take two degrees to, to say that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, real world experience really matters here. Um, when I look at hiring people, when I look at partners, I always look at the what, what did you actually do? Did you build something? Um, I'm not actually advocating for anybody to start a company versus join an existing business. I think if you're in a place that is productive, that you can think and you can build things and you have the mandate to, to think independently, that's good. That's a great start. Yeah. Get that experience five years, six years, and then look out and see if there's something broken you want to fix. You need to understand the problem before you can solve the problem. For sure. Yeah. And admittedly, what seems to be the problem in the first place may not be the... Yeah, you might just be at, this, at the tip of the iceberg of a problem, right? Definitely.
be patient. That's my advice to people. Be patient, get in there, get your hands dirty, be useful to the people around you. Uh, and I think a lot of doors you'll find that are just open. No one's even guarding them. The best thing about this industry to me is everybody wants everyone else to be successful. I think right? it really is a, people say it's a relationship business, but in order for the insurance sector to work, it's a lot of small different businesses connected together, right? And I find that to be tremendously relieving coming from big tech, like the sales forces of the world and things like that. I live in San Francisco. So, you know, it's, it's a very different environment for people. I agree. I uh, appreciate the conversation and uh, I would love to catch up with you next year and see what happened and hold you to your predictions. Thank you, man. I appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Yeah. Risk Management Brick by Brick is brought to you by TrustLayer. Find out how TrustLayer manages risk so that the people can build the physical world around us. Head over to TrustLayer.io. And then make sure to subscribe to Risk Management Brick by Brick on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of the TrustLayer team, thank you for listening.